Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about westward expansion, and more importantly, some of the ideas that drove it. Probably the most important idea associated with westward expansion in American history is a concept known as manifest destiny. And that is going to be the focus of today's video. So let's start with the definition of manifest destiny. Simply put, manifest destiny is the belief that the United States was destined by God to expand across North America. It is at its heart a justification for U.S. territorial expansion as well as American settlement across the continent. So where did the idea of manifest destiny come from? It is important to understand that manifest destiny was never an official doctrine or policy of the United States. That phrase, manifest destiny, was never uttered by members of our government or foreign ministers negotiating on behalf of America. Rather, it was actually coined by a journalist named John O'Sullivan, who in 1845 used it to describe the growing expansionist sentiment in the United States. But it is important to note that John O'Sullivan was not inventing a new idea. The idea of manifest destiny had been pre present in the United States for a long time. O'Sullivan was simply giving it a name. So the roots of manifest destiny can be traced back to earlier in the century. Americans had long had their set, sights set on the West. For example, Thomas Jefferson, our first truly expansionist president, did a great deal of uh, deal to fan the flames of expansion with the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Additionally, the expansion of the American population during the market revolution from 5 million people in 1800 to 23 million in 1850 meant that there was an increased desire for new lands and the economic opportunities that came with them. This fueled the desire for territorial expansion, which hit its high point during the presidency of James K. Polk. In fact, some historians have referred to Polk as the Manifest Destiny president because of how closely associated his administration was with the acquisition of Western lands. So obviously, when we think about Manifest Destiny, we should first and foremost connect it to Western expansion. However, there are other ideas embedded in Manifest Destiny as well. For example, we need to recognize that Manifest Destiny was an idea rooted in nationalism. The idea that God wants Americans to expand across North America assumes that Americans are a chosen people. Therefore, Manifest Destiny was based on the concept of American exceptionalism, which is a belief that the United States has a unique history that makes it special and therefore destined for greatness. This idea that America was somehow special had been building since the end of the War of 1812. Following the War of 1812, Americans felt a growing pride in their country, which was represented in the era of good feelings and the beginnings of a national identity. In some ways, the Monroe Doctrine was a preview of Manifest Destiny because it was a nationalistic policy that claimed America as the protectors of the Western Hemisphere. Manifest Destiny went a step further by claiming that America was destined to take over large parts of the Western Hemisphere. Now, connected to this concept of nationalism and the idea of American exceptionalism was an underlying racist ideology. Since Manifest Destiny assumes that God wants America to expand across the North American continent, it means that by default, other groups who already did occupy these lands were inferior. Manifest Destiny would be used to justify America's war with Mexico, its seizure of Mexican lands, as well as its confiscation of territory from Native Americans. Americans would continually justify their actions in the West by claiming that they were spreading civilization. So, Keep this concept in mind as we talk about the closing of the Western frontier later in the course, because Manifest De Destiny will come back to be a recurring theme in American history, as well as this concept of the superiority of American civilization. Now, another important idea to understand is that Manifest Destiny was controversial. One of the great myths surrounding Manifest Destiny is that it was supported by the entire country, when in reality, there were many Americans who opposed it. Manifest Destiny drew most of its support from Democrats, especially Southern Democrats, who viewed territorial expansion as a way of expanding the institution of slavery. Since most of the territory being added in the 1840s was below the Missouri Compromise Line, the power of the South would increase as new territories such as Texas would be admitted as slave states. Many Northern Whigs, as well as abolitionists and anti-slavery forces, 
were typically opposed to manifest destiny. They were concerned about the expansion of slavery out West. And there was a number of people who saw events such as the Mexican-American War as immoral land grabs. Now, Southerners took manifest destiny even further than most Americans. Cotton depleted the soil of its nutrients, and the South needed to find new lands that were capable of sustaining king cotton. For many Southerners, the territorial gains from the Mexican-American War did not go far enough. For these supporters of Southern Manifest Destiny, they would have preferred to conquer all of Mexico. Therefore, there were attempts by a few Southerners in the 1850s to expand into parts of Latin America. Perhaps the most desirable region was the island of Cuba. With its rich soil, tropical climate, and established sugar plantations, many expansionists in the South were eager to get their hands on it. In 1852, President Franklin Pierce dispatched a group of American ambassadors to purchase Cuba from Spain. Their negotiations resulted in the Ostend Manifesto, which was leaked to the U.S. press. This effectively shut down the negotiations as northern congressmen worried about adding more slave territory to the United States. In some cases, individual Americans actually took it upon themselves to gain more land. William Walker, for example, led a group of Southerners in an invasion of Nicaragua in 1855. For a time, uh, Walker and his Walker expedition was successful in creating a pro-slavery government within Latin America. However, Walker and his forces were eventually overthrown by other Latin American countries and executed. So ultimately, Manifest Destiny would have a huge impact on the United States prior to the Civil War. As territorial expansion became a major issue in the election of 1844, Manifest Destiny served as a rallying cry and justification for the increasingly aggressive actions that America would take in order to add lands such as California and Oregon. These events will be explored further in future lectures. But for now, know that the United States as a whole got caught up in a period of rapid expansion in the 1840s. The additions of the new territories would bring the issue of slavery to the forefront of American politics and accelerate the sectionalism between the North and the South. Thus, Manifest Destiny is not only the context for westward expansion during this time period, but the Civil War as well. Manifest Destiny would also not end with the conquering of the North American continent. The concept of Manifest Destiny will be revisited at the end of the 19th century as America began to look to build an empire overseas. As the United States begins to conquer places such as Hawaii and the Philippines, and uh, it will return to some of the same arguments it used to justify the seizure of lands from Mexico. So make sure you understand the concept of Manifest Destiny. We will be revisiting it numerous times as we move further and further into American history. Take care. Hi guys, it's Mrs. Schacht here, and I'm here to discuss the annexation of Texas. Understanding what happened in Texas in the 1830s is crucial to understanding why the United States goes to war with Mexico in 1846. So this is the contextualization, if you will, of that very event. Now, what's important to note that Mexico had achieved its independence from Spain in 1821 and had invited American settlers to come to Texas. Um, this was such a popular invitation that Americans significantly outnumbered Texans by 1830. And by 1835, there were over 27,000 Americans and 3,000 slaves. Many Americans thought that Texas was a fantastic new area um, directly to the west of the, you know, cotton producing southern states. So they thought it was a great way um, to expand cotton production. This does not sit well with the Mexican government, who is anti-slavery and would love to see the Americans convert to Catholicism, excuse me. So this starts to cause a lot of tension between the Americans in Texas and the Mexican government. One of the first and most prominent family members or families, I should say, in Texas was the Austin family. So if you're familiar with the fact that Austin is the capital of Texas, that's where it comes from. The leader of Mexico at this time is General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, who is a very colorful, kind of quirky character. Um, he serves as the president slash dictator, if you will, of Texas excuse me, Mexico, for 12 um, different terms. Um, he actually lost one of his legs in a battle. 
and held a funeral for his leg, which ironically enough is on display at the Illinois Military History Museum in Springfield, if you guys ever want to check out his leg. But he wanted to make sure that the Americans in Texas were following the rules and knew their place. And when he created a new constitution that would have alienated the Americans in Texas, um, there was a call for war against Mexico by the Americans in Texas. Um, there were kind of two factions. Sam Houston led a faction of men who believed in resistance and war. There are more Americans in Texas. It should belong to us. Um, Stephen Austin called for negotiations and peace. Um, but Tex the Americans in Texas did inevitably go to war with Mexico. They, believe it or not, had a very organized army and navy. And one of the most famous incidents took place at the Battle of the Alamo in 1836, which is in present day San Antonio, Texas. Um, the Alamo was surrounded by the Mexican army. Um, all of the men inside, as well as many prisoners later, were executed. And this became kind of a rallying cry for the rest of the Americans in Texas to remember the Alamo and avenge the deaths of some very brave soldiers like Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, who has a knife named after him, and William Travis. So they continue to fight and they are successful in achieving a Mexican surrender after the Battle of San Jacinto. This causes Texas to declare itself an independent entity. They call themselves the Lone Star Republic, they adopt a flag in 1836, and they name Sam Houston as their leader. So the next natural question is, now that Texas is an independent nation, should it become a U.S. state? And this was a question that plagued the American government for the next 10 years. Um, as you can imagine, there were many people who saw the annexation of Texas to be one that would damage the very fragile balance that existed between slave and free states. On the other hand, you had many who encouraged annexation and encouraged expansion and new land and a new market for a cotton producing economy. President John Tyler, um, it says here he was a Whig, you know, he was actually originally a Democrat and then was basically kind of shunned by the Whigs as well. But he assumed the presidency after William Henry Harrison's death about a month after his inauguration. And Tyler worked very hard to convince Congress to annex Texas um, throughout his presidency. Um, he did a lot of the legwork. Um, he unfortunately was unsuccessful. And when the Democratic Party for the election of 1844 ran candidate James K. Polk, he also ran on a pro-Texas platform. He was nicknamed Little Hickory or Young Hickory. So he is a protege of Andrew Jackson's and is very much pro-Texas annexation and pro-slavery. Um, he runs against, here we go again, Henry Clay. Henry Clay once again loses. And James K. Polk assumes the presidency. It was only you know weeks before he assumed the office that Tyler had been able to get a treaty through Congress with a simple majority vote. So that Polk really kind of had to um, bring it home as he became president and convince Congress and the Texans to sign the treaty. And so Texas officially becomes a state on February 19th, 1846. Of course, um, as you can imagine, this does not bode well for the Mexican government and there will be cries for war um, in 1846. And very shortly thereafter, the Mexican-American War will break out again in direct response to the official annexation of Texas. Hope that helped you guys out, and I hope you have a great day. Welcome back, A-Pushers. This is Mr. Crayson coming at you with another video, this time on westward migration from 1830 to 1860. Why did so many Americans risk life and limb to answer the call to go west? To be clear, West at this time means the far west in places like Utah, Oregon, and California territory. Oregon, Utah, and California had fertile soil for farming, and gold found in California made that territory even more attractive. 
The middle portion of America would not be largely settled at this time and was not seen as a desirable land due to droughts, rougher soil, and deep prairie grass root systems, which made it challenging to farm. So it is not very desirable land. In fact, it was nicknamed the Great American Desert. So why go west? During this time, it was a prevailing sentiment that it was America's manifest destiny to spread its culture, liberty, democracy, and equality from east coast to west. A really significant pull factor was fertile land in places like Oregon and California and even Utah. Um, so that was one reason people went west. Another was to escape race-based and faith-based conflict in the east coast cities. Think the Mormons. So Joseph Smith and the Mormons were being persecuted in New York. They left and went west. They did not find religious freedom here in Illinois where they stopped briefly as Joseph Smith will be murdered by a mob in downstate Carthage, Illinois. Brigham Young will ultimately lead the, the Mormons the rest of the way west to Utah and establish the city of Salt Lake City in 1847. Another major pull factor to the West is that there's gold in Demdare Hills. So in California, gold is discovered. So now this is going to be the, the impetus, the, the motivation for thousands of people to come trekking to the West to get rich quick, finding gold in the hills of California. Another significant element of this is that it attracts people not only from the East, but from foreign countries. Chinese immigrants will make up one third of the miners in, in the West during this time. And it will build up a population of Chinese immigrants to the point where nativists here in America will push for a legislation to be passed to prevent this from happening further. And in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act will be passed. Another gold rush town will be Denver, Colorado, because in 1858, 10 years later, you're going to have gold found there. So Pikes Peak Gold Rush is to Denver, Colorado. That city becomes a booming town um, as a result as well. Now, none of this trekking west would really have been possible without the mountain men's efforts. Now, who are the mountain men? Uh, the mountain men are people who were these rugged individuals that were brave enough to go venturing out west. Most of them started as fur trappers, and um, you know, they then became very knowledgeable of the area to where they could lend themselves as trailblazers. So trailblazers are people who helped lead others through the area and ultimately even map out and chart these uncharted areas. And yes, the Portland, Oregon trailblazers, the basketball team, are in fact named after these very types of men. General John C. Fremont is going to do a map making um, expedition out west and Kit Carson will be his guide along the way. Jim Bridger famously discovered the Great Salt Lake in 1824, making it possible for the Mormons in 1847 to set up shop there and establish Salt Lake City. So these mountain men played a very integral role in discovering these areas out west, um, mapping out paths to get there. A lot of these were you know, Native American trails and, some, and such, but sometimes trails were blazed by these men through these areas to get west. Now, possibly the most famous of these trails is the Oregon Trail, which stretched 2,000 miles from Independence, Missouri, all the way to Oregon. And what was at the end? Why were people going there? Well, the destination was the Willamette Valley, a very fertile land for farmers uh, you know, up in Oregon. Interestingly enough, the Oregon Trail today actually coincides with some major highways. Route 30 and I-80 or Interstate 80 um, do overlap at times with what was originally this western path to Oregon. And there were no railroads at this time going out west. You know, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1828 is, is terminus is in Ohio. Nothing's going out this far west until the Transcontinental Railroad, but that's outside the time frame what we're talking about here. So how are people getting here out, out far west at this time? Uh, the answer is they're either walking or uh, um, on horseback or um, hand cart, or even more uh, famously, the Conestoga wagon. So made in the Conestoga Valley of Pennsylvania, this wagon is rough and tough. It has iron rimmed wheels to rough any terrain. It has a um, 6,000 pound load capacity. So it can carry a lot of people, a lot of supplies out west but it's very expensive, so many people couldn't afford it. The trip out west took about four to six months on average, and this was if you were traveling about 10 to 15 miles per day. And you better leave early. I'm talking like April, May, if you want to be able to get to through the Sierra Nevada mountain passes before snowfall comes in about October. 
If you don't, there are dire consequences, like what happened to the Donner Party. A group of 87 pioneers sets out for California dreaming of a better life. They decide to take a supposed shortcut recommended by Lansford Hastings in his guidebook, The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. This book promised a quicker route, but was based on some misleading information and limited knowledge of the mountainous terrain in the area. A winter storm hits, it traps them in the Sierra Nevada mountains, food runs out after a few weeks, and desperation sets in. Four months they were stuck out there. And in a horrific struggle for survival, some did resort to cannibalism. Of the original 87 travelers, only 48 made it to California. Which just goes to show you the perils of westward migration. The fact that people were still willing to do it tells you a lot about what they thought the payoff would be like. Finally, women going out west served major roles um, in society there. They would follow their husbands out. They would work on the farms with their husbands. They'd open businesses like restaurants and, and boarding houses and inns. Their contributions led in large part to Wyoming being the first state to give women the right to vote in 18. 69. All right, that concludes our video on westward migration. Americans went west. They, they went for farmland, for gold, for religious freedom. They uh, founded these major cities like Denver, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Portland, Oregon, and they ultimately are going to manifest America's destiny out west to the Pacific Ocean. All right, have a great rest of the day. Hi guys, it's Miss Ulrich, and I am here to talk to you about the Mexican War, including its causes and effects, along with how we get the Oregon Territory. The story starts with um, this guy, um, James K. Polk, being elected to office in 1844. He defeats Henry Clay in the Whigs. He will serve one term, and um, you got to love his mullet, by the way. Um, but he's going to be elected um, when he promises four things. Um, one of the things he's going to promise is that we're going to get this land right here, Texas. The second promise he's going to make is that we're going to get this land right here, um, the Southwest area. And the third promise he makes is we're going to get this yellow territory here, the Oregon territory. And the fourth promise he makes is that he's going to do this all in one term. And believe it or not, he fulfills all four of those campaign promises. He was a very, very busy man. Not surprising that he actually dies shortly after finishing his four years in office. Um, a lot of people believed he just worked himself to death. Um, so first thing is that we're going to get Texas um, in 1846. And so you can see that the balance between slave states and free states was maintained, which was a big deal, as was talked about earlier, as to why we didn't annex Texas. Um, so next we go to Oregon. A lot of Americans had flooded out to this region. Um, you know, for great fishing and lumber and so forth. And so um, Americans then wanted to um, uh, make this a part of the United States to annex it. And so the rallying cry 54 40 year fight um, became very big. Remember, anything in red um, is a uh, Quizlet term. And so that meant that they wanted the boundary of Oregon to be up here. Um, James K. Polk um, decides he negotiates with Britain, who owned this territory at the time, and recognizes that we cannot. Um, we, we aren't capable of going to war with Britain at this point, in large part because we're also getting bogged down and fighting um, Mexico, which I'll talk about in a second. And so we end up negotiating here at the 49th parallel. Um, we uh, buy this land from Britain and now we have the Oregon Territory. So that is this yellow chunk of land. So we've got the yellow already and the orange already, thanks to James K. Polk. Now let's talk about the purple. Um, and that actually starts with a border dispute with Texas. So remember, we already had Texas, but the Mexicans say that the border of Texas is this river right here called the Nueces River. Americans say, no, the border of Texas is actually this river right here, the Rio Grande River. So James K. Polk, um, looking to get some more land, he'd actually tried to buy this territory from Mexico and they refused. So what does Polk do? He actually puts troops into this disputed region right here. And you can see it on this next map too. He puts the troops right here. Um, and Mexico, of course, takes this as an act of war, fires upon the troops, and then Polk then 
um, is able to um, convince Congress that now we need to fight back. And that's what this says here. Mexico has passed the boundary of the U.S., has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon the American soil. And with that, Congress declares war on Mexico. Really, the root cause, of course, is us just trying to get more land. Um, some people say that this was, in fact, a provoked war as we were just looking to get more land. You don't have to know anything about the battles, um, but you can see most of the battles occurred in Mexico or Mexican territory. It'll make a, um, a name for Zachary Taylor, a general during this. He'll go on to be president after Polk. Um, the war goes from 1846 to 1848. Ultimately, um, the United States will win, um, killing, though, over 13,000 American soldiers. As you can see, though, most of them are going to be um, from disease. Not very many die in battle. And here you can see where the Mexican War stacks up compared to other wars in terms of how many troops are utilized. And again, in terms of deaths per 100,000 people, how it stacks up. Um, so with the war ending, um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed and the United States now um, is able to buy this chunk of land, a Quizlet term, called the Mexican Session. Um, so we get a lot more land as a result of defeating Mexico. And this, of course, is going to bring about what major hotbed issue that continues to resurface. That would, of course, be slavery. And so um, one congressman named David Wilmot makes this proposal called the Wilmot Proviso. He proposes that um, slavery should be banned in all of this region here in the Mexican session. It was not passed by Congress, but if you ever need a Quizlet term, um, for this time period, this is in 1848, showing that slavery um, was dividing the country. This definitely shows that as we get more land, that whole slavery debate is just going to be magnified because now the debate becomes, what do we do with that new land? Is it going to be slave states or free states? And so, again, if we go back to the map, Polk delivers on his promises. We get the orange Texas. We get this Mexican session now as a result of defeating the Mexicans in the Mexican War in 1848. And we get Oregon. We buy this from Britain. Um, and so Polk is often the forgotten president, but he definitely did a lot in terms of increasing um, our land. Um, so it's kind of sad that not everyone remembers him. All right. That's it, guys. Take care.